Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton and it's time for part 2 of chapter 15, which is episode 23? 24? Something like that. Of my Bayonetta Let's Play. So, picking up exactly where we left off last time for what will probably be the last time since I think the remaining chapter is a boss fight and then there's just the epilogue which is probably not- Hey, does she leave footprints based on her rocket ships? I mean, rocket boots, not rocket ships. Anyway, um... Yeah, it's time to go fight the second boss of this boss, boss rush, which is of course the third boss of the game, uh, who will be extending his wiggly appendages in through this window in a second. Unless that's a different elevator shaft, there's a few of them in this chapter. Uh, I feel like... okay, he must... there we go. yeah, there he is. Um, so, it's interesting to me that these guys seem to come back from death at all. They very definitely get eaten by uh, by devils, so I don't know what's up with that. But um, though they do come back, they seem to come back in massively reduced form. Um, it's not that Bayonetta is stronger because uh, you don't actually, you know, it's not an RPG. You don't gain um, attack power or whatever throughout the game. Um, even the different weapons don't have much of a difference in attack power. And of course, I had the Shiraba and um, handguns when I was fighting him before, so so far it's no different. Anyway, what we're waiting for is for that head to come charging in from behind, which it normally does a lot more willingly, but it seems to be uh, not obliging. There we go. So it's that attack that you really need to be dodging to try and get some damage in, because otherwise it just takes forever. So again, this is one of those bosses where you're kind of waiting for the RNG to oblige you. Um, but yep, you beat him exactly the same as you did the first time, uh, except that this time you only do it once, which is convenient for me at least. I'm taking lots of damage, huh? I'm not especially sanguine about my end of score, uh, end of chapter score, but you never know. So yeah, time to f you know completely just fuck up this garbage, rubbish second version of this boss. I don't know why they come back so weaker. Presumably they are. I don't know. Extensions of some other being rather than themselves resurrected. Because if they are resurrected, why do they care so much about getting eaten in hell, huh? Clearly not a problem for you guys. Oofed, silver. Yeah, not brilliant. Still, I got a few perfect patterns earlier, so that should bring my score back up a little bit. Um, although, to be honest, the amount by which your score is brought up with a perfect platinum isn't as much as it's brought down by, like, a silver or a bronze, so... Uh, it's all swings and roundabouts, which is something I don't think I've said in... Have I said that at all in this Let's Play? I used to say that all the time in my old ones. Anyway, uh, we're going to visit the Gates of Hell real quick just to make sure I've bought everything I can. There's not a ton of useful items at this stage, but... Uh... No matter how much you ask, okay, we've heard that one before. I hope he might have had some kind of like endgame dialogue, but nope. So... We've definitely got all of the treasures we can afford. I don't know what the hell the rest of these are. I know that one of them is the ticket to fight his bonus boss, uh, which we're not seeing anytime soon. I, Some of them must be for the bonus weapons, but God knows what the rest are. Um, the techniques, not really relevant because I don't want to use any of them. I guess I could, I guess I could spend all my money on bonus magic, which I really ought to have done previously to this point because uh, the bigger your magic bar is, the more magic you can store, and therefore the more resistant you are to losing your magic whenever someone uh, hits you. Or you hit someone who's on fire, like an idiot. I mean, you're the idiot for doing that, not hit an idiot who is on fire. Which is rude, frankly. Um, unless you're trying to slap the flames out, in which case, good on you for doing your civic duty to that idiot. So, uh... There's a couple things to grab around here, but um, this is exactly what I was talking about with the kind of... Like, this looks like, I mean, less the statue, which, like, what an enormous 
statue. Uh, <laughs> um, like, it does just look like every other, like, sci-fi evil guy base in every other video game of the era. It's, um, kind of ridiculous. Like, uh, I'm not sure I got that far in Resi yet, but, um, you know, there's absolutely a base that looks like this in Resi 4, in Resi 3, I think. Um, and just a ton of other games, you know, uh, Metal Gear Solid, any of the kind of console games of that kind of era. So if I jump down here, there should be a bonus fight, which I have cleverly brought you so that you can see everything. Most of these bonus fights on this chapter are pretty easy, which is nice because a lot of the chapters have difficult bonus fights. But um, it's not difficult to get through this one without getting hit at all, unless you are me and are trying to pick this thing up off the ground, which absolutely doesn't want to be picked up. So that's more like it. What I wanted to do was this. It is mildly frustrating to me that um, this game is so kind of plainer with regards to its uh, damage hitboxes. It's like um, if something's slightly offset up or down, it's almost impossible to hit it. It reminds me of those old beat-em-ups, the side-scrolling beat-em-ups like Streets of Rage or any of those kind of... Um, any of those kind of games where you play a bad enough dude, you know? Uh, where you end up um, looking like you're about to punch the guy you want to punch, but instead of punching the guy you want to punch, you punch the air a bunch of times and then someone throws a brick at you and then it's game over and then you're like, I spent 50p on this in an arcade at the age of 10. Like, uh, anyway, old wounds aside, what the hell? God damn it! I was looking at my notes. Where the hell did that come from? That's literally... I've been through this chapter like five times and that's never happened. There it is again. There- oh my god, it's Fortitudo! He does show up! Is there a secret bonus boss fight in this level that I've never heard of? Or is that it? Does he just show up to throw fireballs at you and leave again if you idle too long? Oh wow, what a fascinating discovery. I'm genuinely pleased, even if he did hit me with a fireball. Remarkable. Uh, I didn't hear anything about the secret boss fight, and I heard that he wasn't in this chapter at all, so... Maybe just no one's ever idled here before, which seems unlikely, statistically speaking, but... Can I go out here and fight him? Uh, that'd be a no. Uh, I'm actually going to use a healing item, because... I don't want to die. And neither, do, neither does most people, to be honest. Uh, right. So, once again, there's technology that seems adapted entirely to her use and her use alone. Mind you, if this is all based on ancient Lumen Sage Magitech, then I guess it stands to reason that they might share some manipula manipulative techniques with the, uh, the witches. But, um... Yeah, if it's the witch's tradition to do stuff by that kind of wiggling, because, you know, the magic doors and things responded to her energy, so that would make sense, but I do think that I am completely rambling at this point. I'm just so pleased to have seen Fortitudo again. Um, so that's just completely missable. I genuinely had no idea he was in this level. I haven't seen it in any of the research I did before playing this, or recording this, rather. Um... So there's one more bonus fight to take care of um, to finish this verse, which I do want to do because I want to get my proper marks on this level and not be down marked for uh, missing a fight. But that doesn't mean we have to wait for this, which is irritating. As jumping puzzles go, it's probably the only interesting one in the game, but occasionally the cycles are bad and then you do just need to wait for fucking ever. So, yeah. And of course, if you fall off, you have to start back from the beginning the beginning you'll fall the way back down but i think it's on this platform as the other fight yep here we go when will i learn not to punch people who are on fire um as everyone knows witches can't hurt you if you're on fire which i mean fire is usually associated with hell i guess but bye <laughs> anyway okay so that should be Yep, okay. That Right, now I just need to get up to the next ring, which isn't that difficult. But you do have to be careful when you uh, 
use the crow form here because you lose height as you go and if you're not careful you won't have enough height to get up on top of here. So there's two treasure chests left in the game, there's one here and one over there. So that's that and then there is one boss fight left in this chapter, assuming that there's not a secret <laughs> boss fight with the double-headed dragon that we just will never ever see because I have, don't have an hour to prod things and see if I can provoke it. Anyway, there remains one thing that worries me about Balder. There are rumours that he has been partaking in the game of the Lumen Sage, in other words, feverishly hunting out any remaining Umbra witches in order to facilitate his next-gen ener energy research. It is hard to believe that a member of that clan, thought to have crumbled away 500 years ago, still remains, unbeknownst to the world at large. However, when considering that they are purported to have wielded massive power as overseers of the world, the word that this self-styled sage Balder is actively seeking a witch forces one to have major qualms. That was really difficult to read. Um, and of course, while the sound of research into next generation energy is incredibly attractive, the marvellous ascent of Balder, as well as his startup company and his control of an arsenal of armament and fortifications, has been conducted under a cover of total media control. Could one honestly say that all this secrecy was needed for something with peaceful uses? Another troubling sign is the ease of which the ease of which one can acquire information regarding the Ithobol conglomerate as of late. These sentences are almost deliberately constructed to be difficult to read out loud. Is this some kind of clever cipher to prevent people from discovering his notes? Wasn't he a journalist? I thought he wanted people to understand what he was saying. It may just be my journalistic sense, but I feel there is a possibility that Balder is intentionally leaking information. If we make that assumption, that leaves me with no way out. Ever since I began covering Vigrid's transformation and the dark shadow behind the Ithaval group, I have been on an inescapable crash course with the truth. Even if it was a trap, and I must overcome that trap to get to the truth, I am hell-bent on doing so. So yeah, uh... I assume he ended up being a... Oh wait, no, we know what happened to him. Right, because uh, it's never mentioned in-game, as far as I can tell, but uh, officially, the guy who left these notebooks is um, Luca's dad. So, also his name, Antonio Redgrave, uh, would shorten to Tony Redgrave, which is a reference to Devil May Cry. See, I told you, there's just a ton of references in this game to everything constantly. Um, I mean, it makes sense for the director to reference Devil May Cry, considering that's literally the game he's most famous for um but unless i've misremembered that again <laughs> i'm pretty sure that uh was it hideki kamiya must be right i really ought to just learn these names but i have an attention disorder and i cannot learn things like that so that's my excuse and i'm sticking by it come on give me the good stuff this is yet another uh RNG dependent boss fight. If you keep getting the bird and the centipede, you'll have a really tough time doing any damage to him at all because of obvious reasons. Dragon's a little better if you can get the dodge timing right, but the fist is what you really want. Um, probably don't fuck it up. There we go. So it's entirely possible just to dumpster this boss, um, like most of the bosses in this chapter. But I didn't, so that's fine. I am still on my latest horrible post-corona viral syndrome bullshit flare-up, so I'm miserably unwell. So, you know, you guys should be... You guys are lucky that you're getting what you're getting, frankly. Um, you may notice that this is identical to the animation the last time we fought this boss. Just another one of those quick little cost-saving measures. Like it's e like it's literally the same, just transposed into this new location. I think it's genuinely a shame that it that it makes such a, a flat noise when it lands. I would love it if it made that kind of rubber kickball for tongue noise that it, I, think, I think we're all really familiar with at least here here in the UK and in America from primary school playgrounds. Anyway, that just leaves one boss. I think when I was fighting him I said that um, the big dragon guy never showed up again, but uh, he actually does here. Um, so I guess that means that all of the bosses show up again. 
because we definitely fought Fortitudo again in uh, Paradiso, in the chapter that took place there. So all of them show up again, some of them much more than others, I guess. They're also in much, much weaker forms when you fight them again here, which is also what leads me to suspect that they are, you know, projections of some other higher entity rather than um, any kind of resurrected form of themselves. Um, as you can see, he's going down pretty easy. Much like a fine whiskey. Um, He's probably the easiest one of these uh, these few bosses. It's um, he's ugh, like he doesn't fit on the screen very well, but it's uh, his attacks are so telegraphed that you can usually dodge them. So you're probably most likely to score a perfect on this guy, as opposed to any of the others. But uh, it's a lot harder to do this while talking than it is just to just to chill and do this privately. So. That's going to be it for him. And unlike the others who just fucking explode, he gets a much more ignominious end. Ignominious? I have no idea how you pronounce that. So this really fucking stressed me out the first time because this is as fast as you can possibly go and it still looks like it's overtaking you. So I thought for sure I was going to screw up and have to redo something. But no. Um... Bayonetta is going to continue in her attitude of basically just kind of doing whatever the fuck she wants um, without any regard to what damage it might do. As I said before, she is just kind of a grenade of a person. She will just um, be dropped into a situation and uh, cause an immense amount of destruction completely directionlessly. She will just destroy whatever's in front of her if she decides that she wants to. Um, if your thing looks even slightly angelly, congratulations, she's gonna fuck it up. And they absolutely use that to their advantage here, because they wanted her to do this. They want her in this place, at this time, doing these things. Um, it's not exactly subtle. She is not exactly subtle, and... I mean... The old kind of villain manipulates hero into achieving what the villain wanted achieved is, you know, it's a fun trope, but like, come on! As I said before, this woman has zero guile. But, uh, yeah, this wasn't exactly the heist I was expecting when I started playing this game. Way back in chapter one, that uh, intro monologue, that mission briefing about stealing a gem from a nobleman, I thought that was going to be the plot of the first couple chapters and then it would lead to another thing that leads to another thing that escalates and escalates and escalates, but no. It completely abandons that. Everyone's like, weren't you here to steal a gemstone? And she's like, oh yeah, I forgot. And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot too. But, uh, oh, that's a lot of silvers. That's probably going to be a silver overall. Okay, I'll take a gold. But, uh, yeah, like, what the characters think the plot of this game is and what the game starts out telling you the plot is going to be is completely different to what the plot actually is because she does just get bounced from location to location against her will like a kind of a like a kind of a grenade in a pinball machine um and um you know woe betide anyone who gets in her way frankly but yeah she just kind of it's so like, it didn't- it never even occurred to me that that wasn't the plot, you know, for, for the middle third of this game. It never even occurred to me that, like, oh yeah, we were gonna steal a gem from a nobleman. That's what we were doing, right? Like, this is thief or something. And then you get this mad plot about gods and demons and the bringing back of the creator of the world and all of this stuff. And then you're just like, yeah, okay, she's fighting to, to end the, the creator and prevent him from being brought back. That makes sense. No, no, she's not. She's just killing stuff that's in front of her and getting slapped to the next thing to kill. Like, she is just... God. This game is amazing, and I think all of this stuff reinforces its amazingness. Anyway, that's going to be all for me for today. I hope you've enjoyed me rambling deliriously about, um, grenade people. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.